Okay, here we go. So, hi, my name is Biz, and a few months ago, I made a choice. After finishing my biannual rewatch of the Academy Award-winning television show H2O, I was starved for mermaid content, to say the least, and in a moment so fleeting and insignificant that I barely remember it myself, I made the decision to put on the pilot episode of 2013's H2O sequel, Mako Mermaids, or Mako Island of Secrets, I'm American, and it has ruined my life. Turning on the pilot for Mako Mermaids altered my life in ways that I can never undo. Like, I know more about asexual fish reproduction than I ever desired to. I fell so far down the mermaid biology rabbit hole, I hit the Omegaverse. The theme song plays in my head over and over again. It's just an ADHD nightmare for like 114 days. I, I read more books and journals and articles for this fucking thing than I did in my entire academic career and I was an English major. Like, it's, it's a lot. And that's not to say that this is going to be like particularly well researched or that I should be given like any level of credibility for having read a bunch of papers. But that is to say that I want you to take a seat. I want you to put on your critical thinking cap. I want you to watch to the end. And I want you to decide if you think that my arguments hold water. No, but in all seriousness, I encourage you to buckle up, like settle in crack a beer, pop an edible, do what you gotta do, because I am about to go off. Like, <laughs> this script is 22 pages long, single-spaced. Like, I'm not fucking around here. Uh, if you're not on board with that, like, if you're not here to watch me go nuts over a children's television show, um, leave. Like, please leave now, because otherwise, you're in it. Like, you're in it for the long haul. We're gonna sit here, I don't know how long it's gonna take, we're gonna break it up into five sections, and I am going to convince you that while 2013 Australian children's TV show Mako Mermaids may appear on the surface to be a lighthearted romp about some fish out of water teens and the antics they get up to off the coast of a magical island, it is, in reality, a deeply disturbing eco-feminist nightmare that lays bare the consequences of gender-based essentialism and binary separatism, consumerism, and unprocessed generational trauma. This is not a joke. In this world, we're all alone. You know I love my island. The show. So in this world of Mako Mermaids, the mermaids live in these pods, which are only contrived of mermaids. No mermen. How they reproduce is a mystery that will haunt me for the rest of my life, but we'll get to that. The series kicks off with these three teenage mermaids who, during the full moon ceremony, are given the most important job of all time, protecting the moon pool. We all know the moon pool. That's their job. They are protecting the moon pool from the land people so that the mermaids can go and do this. They immediately fail to do this, and a teenage boy falls into the moon pool, thus granting him mermaid powers. After abandoning his unconscious body on the shore, they go and they confess their sins to the mermaid council, where they are immediately excommunicated, and the pod abandons Mako, and the rest of the show's four seasons center around three interchangeable mermaids, girl bossing, gaslighting, and gatekeeping their way to the top of the ocean food chain. But why? Why is the threat of one teenage boy with a tail enough to scare off an entire pod of magical mermaids, you ask? The answer, because this is not the little fucking mermaid, hun, is it? Part one, the lore. Two households, both alike in dignity. In fair Mako, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Jonathan M. Schiff. So through a series of vague and mysterious throwaway lines throughout the first season, we learned that the mermaids and mermen have been feuding for... For a thousand years. And for centuries. For many thousands of years. Eons ago. Centuries ago. What, over a thousand years ago? <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. They, they don't give you a specific. And much like our other favorite, like, supernatural dueling duo, we're not really given a reason for this at first. Like, they, they just kind of 
like hate each other like it's primal it's presupposed they just are enemies and that's like all we know they allude in the first season to some kind of like big event having happened but it's it's all kind of shrouded in mystery at one point one of the only adults on the show does start saying that it was mermaid wars that happened um but they don't really explain this and everyone just kind of starts saying it like i think they just decided at one point that it was mermaid wars but that's it's neither here here nor there it doesn't really matter it's all very ancient and mysterious and we don't really know we also don't really know the merman's perspective on this because we start the show with the mermaids like that's where we start off so we know that within the pod um, at least within the pod that we're exposed to and later within some of the other pods we know that the concept of mermen is basically just that they're really bad no one knows anything about mermen except that they're evil and scary all knowledge of their like specific and special abilities or like specific dangers and interactions with mermaids has been like supposedly lost i say supposedly because they are going to start retconning that whenever it's convenient. Either that or everyone is lying to each other all the time, in which case we'll get there. But while we're still in this section, I want to give you like a quick rundown of like how the show is structured itself and like what it actually does. So like I said in the beginning, we don't really know the merman's perspective on any of this because we don't really see it through their perspective. And that's because the only merman that we do know is Zack. And Zack is brought up on land and doesn't know anything, right? Like Zack doesn't didn't even know mermaids were real before the show started, which you would think would make him like the central perspective of the show and like the central protagonist, the one that we as the audience are supposed to connect to. Like he is like Harry in like the book series that shall not be named, all the kids in Narnia, like the kids in the magic tree house, like through this person who knows nothing about the world, we find out about the magical world. Only no, like not at all, not even a little bit. Because every episode of Mako Mermaids starts with the mermaids and ends with the mermaids. Like the opening shot and last shot are the mermaids dealing with their issues. Zack figuring out he has powers is like entirely like a side plot. <laughs> and the main focus is these girls. We're one third of the way into the season before the main characters even like meet each other, let alone find out that they're mermaids. That takes another like five episodes. It's wild. Like, but since Zack is diving blind into the mermaid world and we really are not following the show from his perspective, the only perspective that we have on the mermaid merman situation is the mermaid side, which as far as they believe, for whatever reason, all mermen are like instinctively evil and out to destroy mermaids completely. Now, we are however many minutes into this video and you're probably wondering at one point, uh, where did all these mermaids come from, right? Like where is all of this history? Why was no one guarding the moon pool? when Emma and Ricky and Cleo fell into it. Where were they? Like, who was helping them? What happened to Zane? Because I'll tell you exactly what you've lost. Me. And you'd be right. You'd be right to wonder that. I wondered that myself as I watched and waited patiently for the moment when there would be like some kind of explanation, a throwaway line, a brief like half explanation of how the pod only arrived to Mako after there was like an asteroid that got diverted, or how they were hiding or anything like that. No, nothing, zilch. They don't mention it ever at all, even once. And it bugged me for a while. Like it really bugged me. It got under my skin that I couldn't find a clear connection between these two. Until I realized that this Mako Island that we see in Mako Mermaids is not the same Mako Island that we see in H2O. It is not the same moonlit circle of magic that we all envisioned and boiled our young tween bodies alive in Marriott hotel rooms across the country, maladaptive daydreaming ourselves into a false reality in which we too would be forced to run from and towards the thing that we love most that makes up 75% of our body, water. No, this is not that Mako Island because despite the show being billed as a sequel to H2O Just Add Water, Mako Mermaids is in fact an alternate universe, canon divergent, Orwellian fever dream following a timeline in which the mermaid population succeeded in destroying the mermen in whatever the event was centuries ago and went on to thrive. Part two, feminist dystopias, utopias, and whatever the hell this is. 
Okay, so Mako Mermaids is not the first science fiction horror story to explore a female-centric society. Sally Millick Earhart's 1979 novel The Wanderground centers around an isolated community of women who, having fled persecution in the now like man-ruled cities, survive in the wilderness, they communicate telepathically with each other. The Wanderground was sort of revolutionary as well in its having like the first lesbian representation in sci-fi and speculative fiction. It also frequently is taught in like universities as an example of work coming out of like the lesbian separatist movement. Um, I first encountered it in a queer lit class. It's like it's a very well-known kind of well-read example of this. It's 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 good. It's good. You should read it. You should read it. Anyway, in 1985, Ursula K. Le Guin published her freaking masterpiece, Always Coming Home, which is like half novel, half encyclopedia of a gynocentric matrifocal society called the Kesh people who in like a distant future live in community with each other and they live peacefully in conjunction with like nature and each other and they are in sharp contrast to the Condor people which are like very patriarchal ruled by men super violent and it's definitely like a weird book to read structurally because it's like half story and like the whole second half of it is just like like fun facts um but it's also like mind-blowing it's really hard to get your hands on too i don't know why uh it just is i guess because it's so good i don't know but if you can get your hands on it if you can find it at like a university library read it it it's amazing and i'm also told that the female man by joanna russ has a sort of like feminist utopia storyline in one of its like four stories but i haven't actually read that one so i'm not gonna speak too much on it but wonder woman even wonder woman's like paradise island depicts like an all-female society focused on peace love and space kangaroos the point is that all female utopian and dystopian societies are not new they are like a thing they've been a thing for a long time uh early 20th century badass charlotte perkins gilman who we probably know of the yellow wallflower uh, published her land envisioning a female utopia with asexual reproduction and elimination of all war as part of this 1915 edition of her self-authored magazine the forerunner and that interestingly was mostly forgotten about like no one really it wasn't didn't really make a splash until it was republished in i think first in the late 60s and then definitely in 1979 so all that in mind in order to move forward with this line of thinking we do need to talk about second wave feminism for a minute. Second wave feminism is the period of feminist activity taking place roughly from the 1960s to the 1980s. I say roughly because like those of us born between 1996 and 2000, sort of floating aimlessly between generations like stray dogs looking for their owners who moved across the country, no one can agree on when the waves were. It's a terrible metaphor. We're not getting into it. It doesn't matter for our purposes, at least not for this video. What matters though, is that we talk briefly about radical feminism and separatism because that came popping up around this time and is relevant to this kind of conversation. So you've probably already noticed that a lot of the language that I've used up to this point is very binary. I've been talking a lot about mermen and merwomen, maybe, and female-centric societies and women's utopia. And that is because while 2013 Australian teen drama Mako Mermaids does explore the consequences of a world steeped in gender binaries and separatist thinking, it doesn't exactly spend a lot of time, you know, discussing the complex nature of gender and fluidity and identity you know it doesn't doesn't really get into it um, and similarly a lot of the work of feminists and the feminist literature of the 70s and 80s uh, works within the binary while not always excluding the concept of gender fluidity and or deliberately like attacking and dismissing the identities of non-binary and trans individuals <coughs> joanne <coughs> a lot of the literature of this time tends to at the very least stick to binary language and at the very worst turf land so the disclaimer here is that while i as a bright shining little queer with my rainbow pins and my she they pronouns 
Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about men and women. Well, mermen and merwomen. I'm going to try to work around it and try to include those of us who exist outside of the binary, but I am just genuinely sorry that a lot of the language is going to be binary based and, and I'm sorry. So that said, given what we know about mermaid society, that they live together isolated in the waters, forming strong bonds with each other and the ocean, it's easy to compare those structural themes found in the 70s and 80s speculative fiction to that of Mako mermaids. Like they sort of, or rather have attempted to follow Sally Miller Gearhart's proposed directions for like creating and preserving a less violent world. They have sort of affirmed the female uh, returned responsibility to women and by effectively eradicating mermaid from the ocean to the point where they are little more than legend to most of the population, they've certainly reduced the male population by at least 10%. You know, I'm going off the assumption for now that the mermaids have some kind of external magical asexual reproduction. They have overcome the biological division of labor that was presented by Shulamith Firestone in 1970's A Dialectic of Sex, which is completely possible, I suppose. Um, you know, after all, who am I to demand that reproduction in a feminist dystopia be reliant on men? You know, it's not like they... All I'm saying is that considering 2012 Australian children's television show Mako Mermaids to exist and be a work of speculative dystopian feminist fiction is not that weird. It happens. Even my theory that it's an alternate timeline, like an alternate history thing, is also not that weird. 1962's A Man in the High Castle does this, 1984 does this, The Female Man does this even my favorite book of like contemporary sci-fi all are wrong todays by eli massad this does this it utilizes this concept as the entire plot it's a thing i'm not crazy her sister was a witch right <laughs> and what was her sister a princess the witch witch of the east bro <laughs> now i don't know what happened to the mermaids in the original h2o timeline maybe they died in a fire Maybe they ate some bad clams. Maybe the Vikings killed them off. I don't, I don't know anything is possible, but I do know for a fact that they were not hanging around Mako Island because these fishes would never have let Cleo, Emma, and Ricky fall in that fucking moon pool. Not a chance. No way would they let what this character later calls the famous Mako moon pool be turned into three land people's personal peer mediation puddle. And we know this because Evie gets a tail in season two. Like Evie, a land character, gets a tail in season two and they're cool with it. They do not hold the same prejudices against land girls who get tails as they do land boys who get tails. So were they to have been around and perhaps, you know, they knew Cleo and Emma and Ricky were there and so they stayed away. They, they canceled their hand-holding thing for the night because of these girls. Were they around at that time, they would have welcomed them in. We know that they would have at least made contact with them. If not right away, they would have made contact when they started fucking around at Mako. They would have gotten up in their business at some point and they did not, so they were not there. It's also unlikely that enough time would have passed between the girls leaving in H2O and Mako mermaids starting because all of the mermaids, they consider Mako their home. Like these teenage girls grew up there. They are like the Mako pod. They call themselves that a lot. They've been around long enough for these girls to feel like home, for Rita, their teacher, to have been part of the Mako pod and left and had a whole other life. Like they've been around since this woman was a teenager. There's no way that this all happened. We're not that far in the future. They've got some cool technology, I'll give it that. They've got some cool fun iPad tricks, but this is not 60 years in the future from H2O, no way. Something happened a long, long time ago that made these timelines diverge and that's that, fight me. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna bring up about pods before we move on to the next section is 
their literal structure, like mm-hmm. the actual way that a pod functions. Mm-hmm. So it's not clear exactly how many pods there are. Like they don't give you an expe- exact number, but we do know that mermaids are typically assigned like a region. So they have southern mermaids, they have northern mermaids, they have eastern mermaids, and I'm assuming they have western mermaids. My guess would be that the western mermaids are somewhere off of the Caribbean and like in the Atlantic Ocean up the coast towards Canada because because they do have a Canadian mermaid at one point. They see a video of this Canadian mermaid and I think that that kind of near the equator region, like near Florida, down towards South America, I think that that would be considered west, at least if we're considering like Australia of the south and like that kind of the center of the universe. I don't know. They've got regions is what I'm saying. And those regions are almost like, like a, not a breed, but, or like a, like a type of, yeah, like I guess like a breed. They're like a, like a species. So they can get different illnesses because they're from different spaces. They are immune to certain siren songs. The northern mermaids are immune to the northern mermaid siren song. And like southern mermaids get snow rash because they are not exposed to the snow, that kind of thing. And we know that there is at least one other like significant pod in either the like South Pacific or like the Indian Ocean, which is where the Mako pod and Serena's sister flee to in the beginning. So they go to another pod that's like relatively close. This is sort of similar to in Always Coming Home, how uh, it's kind of alluded to that there are other communities and societies of people that may, in that case, they may like function differently. Like they're not all strictly patriarchal or matriarchal, but we don't really learn about them because the central focus of the story is the Kesh. Whereas in Mako Mermaids, not only do we learn that there are these other pods, we actually like learn quite a bit about them, or at least about how they interact with each other. We don't get a lot of specifics, but we do know that the mermaids spend a decent amount of time intercommunicating. Like they, they know about each other. Some of them know each other personally. They visit each other's pods. They take in other mermaids. Like the, the pods are not strictly isolated from each other or by each other in any way. And they seem like in general to be very willing to help each other. There is a scene in season one where Serena's sister, Aquata, is telling Serena about like their wonderful new pod and all of the new songs that they're teaching them and like the new fish that they'll see and just the way that they've really taken the Mako pod in since the Mako pod had to flee because of the dangerous terror that is this boy. (laughs) And speaking of sisters, it's super interesting that Serena and Aquata are sisters because not only does that tell us one that the pod are not one family they do not consider themselves all to be family or related in any way but in addition to that they do have a way and they have the language for recognizing individual connection within their pod structure so they are able to recognize like a blood relation we don't know if it's blood because we don't know how they're made but we know that they they can recognize that connection as distinct from the rest of the connection to the pod, which is still supposed to be very strong. We also know that that distinction is not at all arbitrary. Like at one point, Serena is talking to Mimi, who has just found out that Zach is her brother. We'll get to it. Um, And they're talking about how they feel, they can always feel when their sibling is near. Like they can always tell when she's near. I can always tell when a quarter's nearby. I can feel it in the water. So they have the structure within the pod itself to not only recognize each other as a pod, but family members within the pod, and also their distinction from the mermaid council, which is kind of who runs the pod. The mermaid council... Mermaid council are vicious. While they appear to be very willing to help each other under the right circumstances, make no mistake, a pod is not a sanctuary. Like, they, they are not a safe house, they are not a safe haven, and your place there is not guaranteed whatsoever in the slightest. The Mermaid Council can kick you out at any time for any reason. The pod is going. None of you may follow. You've all been cast out. 
They straight up kick out these three teenage girls without even batting a fin and leave them just stranded on this island that they now believe to be an incredibly dangerous and violent environment with an evil merboy on the loose. And they do it again later. They keep doing it. Like the next season, the mermaids run away and they banish them for it. They're like, you dipped. Have fun staying out. Like, I cannot express to you how bonkers the main premise of this show is. Is it girl boss, gaslight, gatekeep, or gatekeep, gaslight, girl boss, gaslight, girl boss, no, it's girl boss, right? Part three, girl boss, gaslight, and gatekeep chronicles. Now I feel like is as good of a time of any to mention that these mermaids, all 75 of them as they interchange throughout the seasons, are the meanest girls that I have ever met in my entire life. They are the girls who bring cupcakes in on their birthday but only bring like five of them for their five friends and then they hand them out during homeroom. These are girls who are carpool to youth group and tell the pastor they think you're a lesbian to get you sent to conversion camp mean. Like these girls are fucking evil. They will tell you it's a costume party when it's not. I'm not kidding, they're so fucking mean, I can't handle it. I can say anything, I feel bad enough. Nonsense, you can always feel worse. The entire story arc of the first season is just gatekeeping and manipulation. It is literally just these mermaids doing everything they can to take their mermaid magic away from Zack because he is a boy and thus has tainted their pristine Mako Island with his like natural violence and cruelty. <laughs> At one point in season one, Nixie and Lila and Serena decide that it is time for them to befriend Zack in order to gain his trust so that he will tell them that he is a mermaid and they can take away his powers. This works, by the way. Like, he confides in them that he is a merboy and they don't even for a single second consider telling him that they are mermaids. They just lie to him constantly for like five episodes and then they follow him and they sneak into this merman chamber and they start a fight with him and then they try to convince him that it's for his own benefit and he doesn't believe them as he shouldn't because they're fucking liars. They're not just mean to Zack either. Like they are mean to each other. In season one, episode 15, the girls literally shut down all of Serena's dreams right away. Despite having regularly forced her to sing songs for them in order to like get what they want, the minute she's like, I wanna sing in this band with this like cute boy that I like and he wants me to sing. And they're like, no, <laughs> like absolutely not. David will destroy your life. We're your friends. We're the only ones you need. Don't do that. And then they like actively sabotage her audition. It's so awful. Um, the boy that she likes, by the way, is this guy, David. Uh, we love David. David is the saving grace of this wasteland of a television show. David is the sweetest thing. And I just want a show about David, to be honest. So in season two, episode 10, uh, Evie's dad has this watch that her mother gave him before she died. And he drops it in the water by the docks at one point. And then he asks Evie to go and dive with him to go get it. Um, Evie can't do this because Evie has been turned into a mermaid since. So they are frantically trying to find this watch before she has to go diving with him the next day. She goes down in mer form to try and find it. And David, while he's like cleaning something on the docks or whatever, sees her. He doesn't see her face, but he does see a mermaid. And he sort of becomes obsessed with proving that he's seen this mermaid. And when the gang catch wind of this, thus begins the most egregious case of gaslighting and just straight bullying that I have ever seen in my entire life. I think it was a mermaid. So first they try to convince David that it wasn't a mermaid that he saw. Must have been somebody snorkeling. Which doesn't work. And so they move on to convincing him that everyone else thinks he's crazy. And as his friends, they believe him, but they don't want to see him humiliated. Which doesn't work also, because David did not come here to fuck around. I don't care. Well, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. 
David doesn't give a shit what people think. David knows what he saw, and David doesn't mind being bullied. David's like, whatever, I'm gonna get proof of this mermaid because I know it was a mermaid. Y'all can deal. So what happens is David sets up an underwater camera with a live feed just to watch for mermaids. But he doesn't just do this at the dock, he does this at Mako. And this is bad because uh, on Dina, this is one of the mermaids we get in season two, uh, she's out there having like a little like smoochy swim date with this boy, Eric, who we'll talk about at some point. So that's like a bad plan. So they sabotage his equipment. He fixes it, of course. So the solution, instead of just telling him the truth, is to have Cam, a non-mermaid, by the way, who knows about mermaids and is the least trustworthy person on the show at this point, besides maybe Eric, they have Cam dress up in a mermaid costume, impersonate a mermaid, swim by his camera, he gets so excited and he gets everyone to look and he's like, I told you, I told you, look. And then Cam turns around and just fucking mocks him to the camera's face and makes him look like an idiot and everyone laughs and makes fun of him in his place of work in front of all of his friends and he is humiliated. They publicly shame their friend into giving up one of his passions and this is supposed to be like a victory. This is supposed to be seen as a win for Teen Mermaid. This is similar to a plot that happens in H2O. They do have like an episode or maybe a series of episodes where Zane is trying to convince everyone that mermaids are real and like searching for this mermaid. And they also gaslight him in that show. Not gonna let them off for that. But in the context of that plot, it is significantly more justified because Zane is still a bad guy. He's not done anything to prove his trustworthiness just yet. So you want to make sure that he doesn't find out because you don't know if he is safe yet. He also is deliberately wanting to do this for personal gain. Like he wants to catch a mermaid. He wants to study it. He thinks he'll make money off of it. He makes that very clear. David, in contrast, is literally Serena's boyfriend, the sweetest creature on the planet, and has done absolutely nothing but prove his trustworthiness to the audience and the characters throughout the show. He's done nothing to cause any harm to anyone ever. That storyline in H2O also is not just for shits and giggles. Like, it's not just dramatic tension, it's not just filler, it serves a purpose. It is for character development for Zane and for the mermaids. Especially for Ricky, who, like, needs to learn to trust people, and the mermaids need to learn that people can grow and change, and Zane is the one who does the growing and changing. The moment that Zane figures out that Ricky is one of the mermaids, in the split second that it takes him to put together why she's been so cruel and why they've been making him feel like he's crazy for so long, the split second that it takes for him to put all of this together is all he needs. He immediately changes his mind. Not only does he immediately understand why they were like that and doesn't hold it against them and is immediately like, oh, this is why, oh, I did a bad thing. Oh, I need to fix it. That is the beats that Zane goes through. Zane, our like archetypal villain of the season, really. I understand why someone has done something to hurt me. I have done something to hurt someone else. I need to fix it. And he turns his back on his like crusade for personal gain immediately. And the speed at which he does that is what makes the mermaid, specifically Ricky, realize that they do not give people enough credit, or at least did not give Zane enough credit to be someone who could grow and change and they didn't offer him an olive branch when they could have. And that's a big thing. That's a big thing for all of them, and it's a big thing for the show in general. Like, that's a big trust and friendship is the point of that show. This doesn't happen in Mako Mermaids. What happens in Mako Mermaids is they bully an innocent kid, and then afterwards, when he says, you know, it's probably for the best that you humiliated and shamed me because I wouldn't want anyone to study her. I would want her to be free. Even after he says that, they're just like, yeah, sucks they're not real. It's fucking awful, it's awful, it's evil, I hate it. Especially because Cam already knows about mermaids and Cam at this point is one of the worst people. Like he's so evil. Before we wrap on David for the moment, just want to point out this David who when Serena stopped singing in the middle of their set and said I have to go and he said why and she said I have a sore throat I'm sick 
faked a cough and ran out. This man's first response, the first thing out of his mouth is, well, you can't help being sick. Like, what? Why? It's her throat. Yeah, right. It's really sore. We have to get her home. I'm so sorry. Well, you can't help being sick. This is the man they can't trust. This is the man they can't trust. Ah. Okay, we're giving up on the sweater. It's too hot. <sighs> okay. Where are we? Um, okay, so. What is this gaslighting, you ask? Is it really, like, isn't it justified if it is? Because aren't these mermaids just acting in self-preservation? Isn't a mermaid's biggest secret her tail? Isn't the big, most important mermaid law to keep your tail a secret, right? Like, isn't this what's happening? Sure, maybe. I don't know. I don't have the energy for the ethics conversation just yet. We're an hour and a half into filming this. So if you want to give them a pass for gaslighting the shit out of land people to keep their mermaidness a secret, fucking go for it. But you know what I'm not going to give them a pass for? You know what I'm not going to let them off the hook for? Gaslighting each other for centuries. In the novel Always Coming Home, Ursula K. Le Guin poses the following question. In a state, even a democracy, where power is a hierarch, how can you prevent the storage of information from becoming yet another source of power to the powerful, another piston in the great machine? In the world of Always Coming Home, knowledge is stored in like a massive satellite, right? So it's called like the city of the mind or referred to as just the city. And it's where all people of, of the whole planet, so not even just the cash people, are encouraged to go and to uh, store and record like their stories and their experiences being a human. Um, so it's like a, it's a full database of the human existence and experience. So all people of Earth have access to the city. There are access points all over, but different cultures and groups have their own kind of personal relationship to it. So they have their own rules and their own structures around it. The Kesh people, our like gynocentric matrifocal society, they have full access to the city, everyone does, but they choose, like, collectively and individually to rarely use it, as they, they see no need for it. While the Condor people, the mostly male, very patriarchal, violent, sort of war-driven community, actively restricts that knowledge to their people. So they put, like, active limitations on how much of the knowledge that is in the city the people have access to. The mermaids in Mako Mermaids have taken a similar approach. This is Rita. We're gonna talk about Rita. Oh, I love Rita. I think she's hilarious. We mentioned her briefly. She is the principal, right? She is the school principal. She is also a mermaid who was kicked out slash decided to abandon the pod after she fell in love with a human, which by the way, we literally never learn anything else about. Like she mentions it once or twice. But it just not, it doesn't come up again. Like, it's really not important. It's weird because they make it seem like it's going to be really important. This, like, man that she was engaged to and who died mysteriously. But it doesn't come up <laughs> after that. Like, there's a bit of a scene where Andina is, like, trying to make a decision on whether to stay on land or go back to the pod. And, and she kind of talks to Rita about it and she kind of brings it up. But it's really not. It's not relevant. So season one, episode eight. Rita tells the girls that no one knows anything about mermaids. No. So season one, episode eight, Rita tells the girls that no one knows anything about mermen. However, by the end of the episode, she is then telling them that Zack, if they don't stop him, will have more powers than all of them. And this happens constantly throughout the series. Rita says she knows nothing, big mystery, she only knows bad, dangerous, and then suddenly, do ex mermaidia, she reveals that she had known all along this one weird secret piece of information that will help them solve the mystery of the week. Just level with us, Rita. You don't actually know, do you? No. No one knows for sure. It's your decision, of course, but there is something you should know first. The chamber was built in the time of the Merman Wars to strike terror into mermaids and to win the war against them. So season one, episode 20, everyone agonizes over what this trident is and what does it do? Because no one has seen the Little Mermaid in this universe. And Rita gets bored, I guess, and suddenly decides to tell them 
at like the last minute of the episode that the trident was designed by mermen who tried to seize Mako from mermaids years ago and it is like deliberately designed to take away and destroy the power of mermaids and that apparently she also knows that if the trident is taken into the moon pool on a full moon it will destroy the moon pool forever and this is apparently a mermaid's biggest secret even though they didn't know any of this before is this a case of lazy writing sure to the untrained eye maybe but to those of us willing to sacrifice our own well-being in the name of mermaid analytics it is a very interesting answer to ursula k le guin's earlier question it is a statement that knowledge is dangerous knowledge is powerful the mermaids recognize that and what we are being shown in this sequence of events and the many times it happens over and over again is not that the writers suddenly need to move the plot forward no it is that these are the consequences of attempting to take knowledge out of the equation entirely in order to prevent it from becoming a weapon mermaids as a, as a culture as a people as a population they are almost like the cash people in that they don't see it as necessary but they enforce it like the condor people by not allowing access to it like the cash they see no need for it they see it as dangerous but they don't know what to do with that right like you can't just ignore knowledge it really doesn't work like the condor people they have put restrictions on it they've put limitations on it so people know things they do know things but they don't share them and they don't have an instinct to share them because their instinct is that this knowledge is dangerous it becomes really clear watching the show how much of a driving force fear is to the mako pod and to mermaids in general like they are terrified of merboy zack and they also are afraid of what these three teenagers could possibly do if they were allowed to stay in the pod, so they kick them out. They're afraid of land people, but above all, I think that what they're afraid of is history repeating itself. They have all of this knowledge of their history, mermaids, mermen, Mako Island itself, and they lock it behind these like metaphorical and sometimes physical gates. Hi kitty, can you see her? Hi, gorgeous. We're talking about gatekeeping. Yeah. So they have all this knowledge. And look, I hate to say that all of the trouble in the first three seasons could have been avoided if people had just shared their information. I don't like that argument because I know that television shows need drama to be worth existing, right? Like, that's the point. But if the mermaids had even one book, one single solitary book, titled History of Mako Island, or Why We Hate Mermen, The Specifics, or even just things we really, really, really don't want to ever happen again. You know, like if they had that book, if they had just one of those books, you know, like, ugh. Anyway, speaking of mermen, they have an entirely different approach to knowledge and their culture has like an entirely different relationship with it. So in season three, Rita tells Zach not to go into this mermaid game show set, I mean merman chamber, that they have discovered on Mako Island because she is afraid of what will happen if they do. So he's like, why? And she decides that this is the right time to finally inform him that he is in fact descended from an ancient merman and mermaid who fell in love and ended the mermaid wars and don't worry i'm gonna get back to that one so after she drops this bomb and asks zach not to go into the merman chamber because it could possibly be dangerous for the mermaids by the way still zach's not evil so he's like sure i won't go and goes to find eric eric we mentioned him earlier showed up in season two kind of a villain kind of not sort of just like whatever he needs to be that week i don't know there are so many characters at this point in the show that i think they just pull lines out of a hat to see who says what and they're all such awful people that literally anyone can become a villain at any point but regardless he goes and he tells eric and he's like i'm not going to go to the chamber because Rita is afraid of what's gonna happen. And Eric responds with this. Of course she is. So what's the best way to conquer fear? Knowledge. Which is just, I mean, come on. 
right? Like, it's, it's like they wanted me to write this essay. You know what I mean? The same way that Disney and Pixar will sometimes put, like, adult jokes into kids' movies for the family so that, like, the parents can kind of enjoy it too, but the kids don't notice. It's like the creators of Mako Mermaids just drop these little like nuggets of analytical glory specifically for burnt out college graduates with no sense of self desperately trying to justify the thirty thousand dollars they spent on an english degree that they're not using by finding any possible way to expel all of this like pent-up academic energy so if you remember the community of women in sally gearhart's the wanderground they communicate with each other and the animals that they live in and nature like psychically and telepathically. The idea is that they have so strongly evolved their psychic connection to the earth and each other that they essentially have their own form of magic. The way that the mermaid's connection to Mako and the moon gives them their powers, the women in the Wanderground are able to levitate things, they're able to fly, they can talk to their like dead ancestors sometimes, and that's just like a central theme in this novel is connection and also memory and how memory equates to or does not equate to knowledge. Like knowledge in Always Coming Home, the knowledge in the Wanderground also has power. The Hill Women, who are the community in the Wanderground, they don't keep any kind of a written record. They, they reject literacy as a masculine and instead they preserve their stories through memories. In season two, episode eight of Mako Mermaids, Mimi gets curious about land school. She is a mermaid and she wants to find out what land school is all about. And so after her friends tell her that they think it's dumb and she shouldn't do it. You shouldn't be here. What's the problem? She's just looking around. She doesn't want to look around. Come on, Mimi. I certainly do want to look around. Eric is the only one who's willing to like give her a tour of land school and show her what it's about. And while they're on this tour, they end up in the computer lab and Eric is showing her the internet and she's like super fascinated by this way of learning. And she says that it's because in mermaid school and in mermaid culture, they learn through storytelling and they don't write things down. They don't have books on things. They just tell stories. Not the important ones though, apparently. Has she told you anything about the chamber on Mako? Only that it's dangerous. Did she say why? No. In contrast, the mermen, they grow up on land, they go to land school, they have a lot of written records, they learn both traditional like earth history and everything that normal kids learn in school, and they also clearly know a lot more about mermaids than mermaids do about them. So while the mermen like embrace this worldliness and this understanding of both land and sea culture and mermaids and merman history, the mermaids reject literacy as masculine like the hill women do and they don't learn it. Instead, they focus on connection and experience and hiding knowledge from other people and gaslighting everyone that they meet. In season two, episode 13, after Mimi and Zach start having like mind meld connections, Rita looks Mimi in the eye when she asks if she thinks that this has anything to do with her mysterious dead mother. Rita looks her in the eye and says, no, I don't think so. Fully knowing at this point that Mimi, whose mother is an Arissa, who had children specifically that could share visions with her brother. Fully knowing all of that. Why is it just me and Zach that have these visions? What's the connection? I don't know. I was thinking. And then Viridia comes back and is like, there's no way that a land boy could have accessed the chamber. And two scenes later shows up and calls Zach the son of Nerissa. So like Viridia knew as well. And Rita finally tells them all of these details about their mother's life that no one ever thought to bring up in all of Mimi's like 16 years of life. Prior to this, no one wanted to mention it to her. No one, no one thought to bring this up at all, ever. So not only does this mean that some mermaids, at the very least Viridia herself, have always known that Mimi has had a brother somewhere and just never told her. And the way that she says, You don't get it, do you? No land boy could have unlocked the chamber. Don't you get it? No land boy could have accessed the chamber tells us that not only did she know that there was a chamber the whole time, as apparently everyone did, but never said. But it, it kind of implies that she may have known the whole time 
that Zach could not have fallen into that moon pool that first night if he were just the land boy. Now we know why we couldn't take Zach's powers away. He was never a land boy at all. Which explains why they were so terrified in the first season. I will give them that. But it also means that she knew the whole time, especially in the second season when she lets Andina and Mimi go to try and break his connection to Mako, that she knew that it likely wouldn't work because he is a merman by blood. He is connected to the island because there is a chamber that was built by a merman who she knows is Mimi's father who had a son with her mother that no one has seen since he was born. Now, technically, that is conjecture. Technically, she doesn't say that no land boy could have fallen in the moon pool. We don't know for sure. Technically, the chamber from seasons two and three is different from the, like, cave in season one that Zach falls through. But I just felt like it was important to mention how little information these mermaids share with each other and how little family is valued in the pod. They don't give a shit. Okay, so we covered the way that these fish are girl bossing their way through life and taking matters into their own hands to save Mako. We talked about the gatekeeping of knowledge and information. We covered the gaslighting, both canonically and historically. It's all been very educational and very analytical. You know, a whole lot of logos, not a lot of pathos, if you know what I mean. Very, very boring. You're super desperate for some, some feeling, right? some emotion. And I get it. You want to feel something. I would love to feel something. I haven't felt something in years. And I want to give that to you, you know, as, as your friend, as your confidant, as someone actively trying to convince you of a crazy point that they made up, I would like to offer you an olive branch of feeling. Seeing as we're at about the halfway mark, and I am a little too drunk to continue, before we dive any deeper into these treacherous waters, here is my gift to you, a rapid fire collection of the best gaslight, gatekeep, and girl boss moments that did not make it into this analytical section. Cheers. We're really sorry, aren't we, Nixie? Not really. He's my best friend. Must get sick of him. Don't you want some new ones? No, not really. I would. You probably do too, you just don't realize it. Something a real mermaid would understand. I hope that boy is feeling as bad as me. Joe's obsessed with the sea monster. He's going to the authorities about it. Relax. No one is going to believe him. He'll open up to us about his new powers. And then we'll convince him that we can help him lose them. But we actually don't know how to do that. Yeah, and uh, what if he doesn't want to be a friend? How many friends have you made? Mimi, don't be stupid. The full moon ceremony tonight. You should come. She doesn't have a moon ring. Mermaids! Mermaids! Like the mermaids are real. I saw them do magic. Of course they are, little girl. What happened to the big brave merman who said he could handle anything and dished out? <laughs> you never say sorry. You never change your mind either. You care about Mimi, don't you? Only you can give her back the life she had. You don't think she deserves that? I prefer a soft dry bed. I hear there's one waiting for you in Shanghai. I'm Dina. Can't help thinking something's happened. Like what? Like nothing. Nothing's happened. What are you doing here? We had a deal I'd come alone. You want to protect Mimi? So do I. And all mermaids. I've always said I'd do that. We might not have a choice. Why are you being so nice to her? She's a mermaid. Just like us. She's not like us. We have to get out of here. You have betrayed your kind. You are no longer a part of the pod. I'm sure we can trust him. He cares about me. He'd never do anything to put me in danger. Do you really know him that well? They're the mermaids! Mermaids? No mermaids here. I saw you! Taffy. You didn't think of telling us? We need to understand this threat. We don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on. Her voice went so high, it smashed Evie's figure into pieces. It, it just, it does that sometimes. She spoke to us. I have no doubt that you think you saw something. We did see her. She's alive. You didn't want to do that. You just weren't listening to us about David. Being with him would wreck your life. I just did that. My advice? Do as we say. So, what do you suggest? Sink their boat? We're back. 
Where were we? Uh, let's see. Okay. Part four, ecofeminism, consumerism, and that damn island. Damn it! Crap! Crap! The term ecofeminism was a term coined by French feminist and philosopher Francois de Bonne in her 1974 book uh, La Feminisme ou l'amour. Um, I think I butchered both of those. It focuses on the parallel oppressions and dominations of women and the environment and sort of makes the argument that the liberation of women is intrinsically tied to the liberation of the environment. Um, I say sort of because ecofeminism has its own very interesting history. Um, it's not actually used that often today, at least not on its own, and this is partially uh, because a lot of the early work of ecofeminism had that very like essentialist uh, men and women are different thing going on, and partially because it casts just like such a wide net and covers so many different things that like even evolving it past its very like white essentialist or dualist kind of starting point, it's still really difficult to use at least as a critical lens in like an intersectional way without having to spend a lot of time making caveats and explanations like I'm doing now. It's important to remember, uh, if this is the first time you're hearing about ecofeminism, that ecofeminism is not the same thing as environmentalism. There were and still are many people of color fighting to protect the environment and working within both ecofeminism and other adjacent movements and circles. The San Francisco Department of the Environment has a really great article that I will link in the massive description below and that just like highlights literally like black activists that you should know about. Um, also there's Indian scholar Vandana Shiva who was and continues to be a very powerful voice like within ecofeminism itself. So it's definitely not exclusively white. Um, that said, the movement was pretty heavily criticized for being very white, um, very essentialist and relying on and perpetrating this idea that women specifically are somehow connected to nature in a very specific feminine way. And the way that it equated the domination of the environment as a direct parallel to the exploitation of women and just like the whole one and two of it you know what i mean like between that and its lack of intersectionality it just didn't really take off past the late 90s early 2000s and was either replaced with or evolved into like more specific inclusive concepts like queer ecology and intersectional environmentalism, Afro-ecofeminism, black feminist ecology, black feminist ecoethics. Links to some of those uh, will be in the resources as well as a link to an amazing video by Brianne Pinn, which I highly recommend you watch because she talks about her experiences with ecofeminism as a person of color and it really, like, it definitely made me think differently about ecofeminism and about um, the way that I approach the topic and also just people of color and their contributions to environmentalism and environmental work in general. It's very interesting. She's a very interesting thinker. Please go watch it. I'm glad I did. And finally, we will be referencing this book by Greta Gard and a host of other authors published in 2014 that also spends a lot of time sort of parsing out the connections between environmentalism and all forms of oppression. So there's that. Back to Mako Mermaids. So after Sally Miller Gearharding 10% of the male population, I mean, somehow getting rid of all the mermen in the sea due to a mysterious big event and or the mermaid wars, still not sure which. After that, the mermaids go on to flourish. They live a life of luxury. They're swimming with dolphins. You know, they are eating shellfish. They're, they're picking fresh seaweed for seaweed ice cream. They're doing whatever the hell this is. And everything's great and life goes on and time goes on. The tides keep turning, things change, humans begin sailing further and further out into sea for longer and longer periods of time, islands begin turning into resorts, scientists start mapping the ocean floor and poking their noses into shipwrecks, some of which were definitely caused by mermaids. They're deep sea diving and dumping their waste into water, there are glaciers that are melting, there's oil spills everywhere, pirates abound at one point cannons 
flying through the air. There are missiles and torpedoes being shot underwater. Wars, entire wars are being fought at sea. Coral reefs are decaying. Entire species around them are being wiped to extinction. The world has become a terrifying place and these have become some terrified fish. In Janice Birkeland's section of Guard's book, she states that if we attempt to change the patriarchal system by playing patriarchal games, then we are abetting those who are directly involved in human oppression and environmental exploitation, right? You know, you cannot beat fire with fire. And she says that merely redistributing power is no answer. We must change the fact of power-based relationships and hierarchy and move toward an ethic that is based on mutual respect. We must move beyond power. Problem is, uh, no one told the mermaids this when they Time Lord victorious their way to feminist glory. The laws of time are mine, and they will obey me! Carol Gilligan's 1982 seminal masterpiece, In a Different Voice, follows up on research that was performed by Nancy Chodoro prior to that um, into the distinct moral developments of men and women, or as we would probably put it today, like the moral development of individuals assigned as and or being raised slash socialized as women and versus those assigned as and or raised and socialized as men up until the late 70s. The research found that a sense of individuality was more common in those raised and socialized as men while a sense of interconnectedness was more common in those raised and socialized as women and that distinction and those uh, individual like senses of either interconnectedness or individuality became the basis for two different ethical theories. The feminine sense of interconnectedness led to what is called an ethics of care and the masculine sense of individuality led to a rights or justice based ethics. <coughs> and cells, <coughs> and cells, Whew, sorry. And this appears to be the framework in which Mako mermaids like exists and functions. So the mermaids, as we are led to believe, operate under a care-based ethical system. You know, they are part of the ocean. They are only doing all of this girl bossing because they want to go home to their families, right? They want to save Mako Island. And it's the mermen with their individualistic rights-based ethics that are stomping all over everything. And I think this is true. I think this is what the show wants us to think at first, because look at how quickly their male protagonist turns into a literal supervillain. So the show clearly wants us to believe that mermaids are in the right coming from a place of care and mermen are in the wrong coming from a place of entitlement and justice seeking. But how true is that really? You know, because sure, they say things like, I just want to go home and I want to save Mako and we're part of the ocean. But like, what do they do, right? You know, it's an old TV adage, like, show, don't tell. What do the actions of these mermaids tell us about their ethical system? A shit ton is the answer. A shit ton. In season one, episode 22, we see Serena's older sister, Aquata, return to Mako for the first time in the season. And she is still terrified, living under the threat of dangerous mermaids. But she does return and she tells Serena that she has been able to convince the Mermaid Council to let her return. This is a big deal. Like, Aquata has worked really hard for this, clearly. And she's so excited. And Serena has basically talked about, like, very little else besides David and wanting to go home to her sister for the whole season. But there's a catch, because there's always a catch. And that catch is that Aquata only made the deal for her sister, right? Because the terms of the deal are that she, Aquata, will be personally responsible for watching over Serena and making sure that she doesn't get into any more trouble. And there is no way that she could be expected to guide and watch over all three of the delinquent teens, right? So she only makes the deal for Serena, which I might even believe is an act of care if this weren't the same pot of mermaids that gave three teenage girls the most important job 
on the most important night and then excommunicated them for something that wasn't their fault and they didn't warn them was a possibility about and likely knew was out of their control and then left them alone to fend for themselves in the midst of what they believed was a dangerous, violent, power-hungry merman running around trying to destroy all the mermaids. If this wasn't the same pod that pulled that shit, I might believe that this is an act of care, but it is that same pod. So fuck that. What this actually tells us is that there is not a single other person in that pod willing to take responsibility for those other two girls. Not even their parents, if they have them, are willing to say, I will keep my daughter out of trouble so that she is not stranded in the ocean with a violent merman on the loose no one else is willing to take on that role. Why? Because the mermaids, as a population, having spent thousands of years under the oppression of mermen, have now developed their own sense of opposition and hierarchy, right? They use their connection to nature and the sea and their supposed sense of like interconnectedness to distinguish themselves from land people as more intelligent, more practical, more important and more deserving of land in this case specifically mako island and like apart from that one time we saw a video of a canadian mermaid singing a siren song and definitely drowning that one fisherman we don't really hear about the mermaids dominating and attacking land people prior to the show and they probably don't exercise that dominance against land people because they can't because land people have guns but what they do establish dominance over is the rest of the fucking ocean, right? It's established at the very beginning of the pilot, prior to any merman business, that the Mako pod, at least, regularly scare fish away from Mako Island in order to keep land people from coming there so that they can do this. I can't, I can't. They do this at least once a month and they do it while exploiting Mako Island's status as like a preserved landmark. You know, Evie's dad at one point needs a permit in order to dive there. So this, this land is protected by land people because of the fish, presumably, because the land people don't know that there's mermaids there. They do this to these fish, these fish that, that live there, that are part of the ecosystem that keep Mako Island alive. This ocean system that they are supposedly like so connected to, they just shoo them away whenever they want. Because what these mermaids have unwittingly done is begun playing a patriarchal game of their own. They have adopted a sense of justice ethics under the safety of this like perceived care ethics. They hold votes, they plead cases, they excommunicate teenagers. The pod rules with an iron fist and inspires fear in everyone around them. Even that clip I showed you earlier, remember this one? We love to help, but we're too busy taking over Mako. This is how it ends. We're not giving up the moon pool. It belongs to us. Mako Island has become nothing but real estate to them. Just a way for them to gain more power, more moon magic, charge up their moon rings so that they can go and continue to wreak havoc across the oceans with their seaweed ice cream and giant fucking water dragons. We'll get to it, I promise. <sighs> They've commodified it. They don't even consider Mako Island to be like existing on its own anymore. You know, I feel like in, in H2O, Mako Island used to be this like mystical piece of land that was like alive with magic. It was personified in a way that was different from anything else. You know, it, it chose people, it, it gave them magic, right? It actively communicates with the mermaids when it needs their help and it defends them in return. Whereas in this alternate timeline where mermaids have continued to exist beyond whatever it was that wiped the pot out before, they have dominated Mako so fiercely that even when they know, they know that the island is alive, they know that it has its own connections and feelings and they don't care, they know. 
that Zack and the island have a connection. It's not Zack is drawn to the island. They know that the boy and the island are connected. Viridia says this. The only way to fix Mako is to break the boy's connection to it. They don't even consider for a minute what that connection means to the island. And again, even going back to the pilot episode, before any of this merman business, the mermaids were regularly guarding, not just the exterior of the island where they were doing their little hand-holding business and where they could perhaps be seen by onlookers, like they are guarding the moon pool itself inside of the island, specifically during the moments of the full moon where it is at its most powerful and fully activated. It is at that moment when the moon is at its most powerful in the full moon and it's pouring itself into the island impugning it with all of this magic to the point where it's just overflowing with it and the island like comes to fruition and comes into its own and is able in those brief beautiful moments to to share that magic and to pass it on and to gift it to whoever it sees fit the mermaids lock it up they have taken it upon themselves to stand, swim, sentinel at the island's source of magic just to ensure that no one else could possibly have access to it, no matter how close they got. It's no wonder that the island had to open a magic door and drop Zack in from the sky straight into the water. Otherwise, they wouldn't have let him in. This is our place, get out. Right? Like, they're mean. These girls are mean. They're not nice. God knows what they would have done to him if he'd just like wandered in the normal way or fallen through that hole in the H2O. Like, who knows what they would have done to him? These mermaids take this eco-feminist idea and concept that liberation of the environment is intrinsically linked to the liberation of women or like in the modern context, all oppressed groups. And they use that to justify their actions as an oppressed group. As they see it, if they can release and free Mako Island from what they perceive to be an evil man poisoning it, then they themselves are also liberated and, you know, can return home to Mako. Problem is, they're not actually doing that, like at all. <laughs> Greta Gard writes that what is certain is that a failure to recognize connection can lead to violence and a disconnected sense of self is most assuredly at the root of the current ecological crisis. The crisis on Mako Island is not the fact that this teenage boy got a tail. It's the fact that these mermaids have commandeered it as their own personal magic battery, and if they can't have it, no one can. So early on in season two, after two new teenagers have been banished from their pod for running away from the pod, the gang discovers this merman game show set. I mean, sorry, I mean merman chamber, hidden within the other merman chamber that we talked about. It's confusing. I don't know. They find it and they immediately want to destroy it, is the point. Like, we believe this is the only way to ensure its complete destruction. And when that doesn't work, their entire goal becomes ensuring that this thing can never be activated. That magic can never flow through it, even when someone's life is at stake. Although that was a merman's life that was at stake. So, anyway, point is that they find this entirely new, magically created space inside of this island right and even when viridia is almost positive completely positive that destroying this chamber will destroy mako island she still demands that andina do it she does this by the way after having banished andina right and she doesn't even offer it as like a way to get back in the pod like andina has to be like i'll do this on one condition you lift my banishment and Viridia has the nerve to be like, this is not a negotiation. And Andina's like, yeah, yeah, it is. I want to come back and all of my friends want to come back. And Viridia still has the nerve to be like, if it works, fine. But only if it works. Blowing up the island! Their feminist utopia has completely fallen apart. By the time that the pod is faced with what they understand as a genuine ecological crisis, this merman, it's too late. They are so far down in these waters that they don't even recognize the fact that as Rosemary Ruther writes, in that case of women, in this case of mermaids, 
there can be no liberation for them and no solution to the current ecological crisis within a society whose fundamental model of relationships continues to be one of domination. They continue to dominate each other. They need to prove their power over anything and everything smaller than them. And it might sound like I'm victim blaming. I'm not. I get that they've been through some shit, right? Like this is not out of nowhere. They're not intrinsically evil. I'm just saying that years of violence and trauma inflicted upon the population has left these deep, like insidious wounds festering at the very core of their existence and that it sent them spiraling down like the Marianas Trench of shame and anxiety and just stripping them of their interconnectedness, replacing it with self-preservation. And then all of this, this, this pain and this anger and this fear, like that doesn't just go away when the mermen do, that shit stays put, bottled up right alongside this new sense of like safety and freedom and relief. And, and they manifest into this hierarchical sense of individualism and entitlism out of which rises this authoritarian regime willing to sacrifice its own children on principle. Hurt people hurt people. Additionally, the elimination of their oppressors has left the mermaid population with like an abundance of resources, right? So if we imagine that prior to the like big event, mermaid wars, whatever, the general like merperson population was like 50-50 mermaids and mermen because this particular universe clearly operates under this absurd notion. Either that or there is a population of like non-binary mermaids with super sexy purple tails that were like just smart enough to stay out of all of this like heteronormative essentialist nonsense. It's my head canon. You can do what you want with it. Either way, within the context of the show, we know that mermaids have not seen mer mermen in a very long time. So we can imagine that the population of mer people, as they were, was suddenly halved or at least like significantly altered since most mermaids hadn't seen mermen for years, eons, decades, right? If that is the case, then it would be big news in terms of resources for this population, right? Especially considering that all of this happened way before humans were like fucking up every corner of the ocean, you know what I mean? Not only would there be more food, more places to live and sleep safely, more plants to rip up and make into ice cream, more plants to rip up and make into jewelry, more magic moon spaces for them to charge up their magical moon rings and moon jewelry, which, by the way, have to come from somewhere, right? And we never actually learn where they come from in Mako Mermaids, but in H2O, we do learn that those gems that are in their necklaces, which seem similar and sort of seem to function in the same way, are mined, like from the rock of Mako. So they're either coming from Mako itself, or what is more likely is, since other pods have them too, there are other places you know, out in the world that, that get moon power and get moon magic and, um, and grow these, these moon rocks. But with the population somehow constantly growing without like significant threat, even if they were recycling all of their rings, they would constantly have to be making more. They would constantly need to be mining and creating more of them. But biz, it's not like they have an economy. They're not selling goods and services. They need food. They need places to sleep. The crystals probably grow back. It's not like they're capitalizing on any of this. Part five, the sea dragon, capitalism, and the birds and the bees. So end of season three, Eric, this guy goes full mervillain and tries to drain the moon pool of all of its magic, right? Which almost kills all of the mermaids, but then Zack sacrifices himself only for his long lost mer sister, Mimi, to bring him back, effectively proving that yes, all mermen are evil, except for this one. Undina breaks up with Eric in this amazing sequence. Undina. Think of all the time you made me cry. I always hold you deep in my heart. Uh, 
uh, Serena finally tells David that she's a mermaid. Viridia tells the girls that she had no faith in them ever, that they could do it. The pod returned to Mako, and Cam and Carly smooch, and everything's great. It's fantastic. They get picked up for another season two years later. With the season three finale having effectively served as a series finale, wrapping up like centuries of gender wars and unraveling three seasons of secrets and lies, there's really only one mystery left to solve, right? There's really only one question that has gone unanswered. And that is, where do mermaids- <laughs> Or that, I guess, Four picks up about a month or so after the end of season three. Serena has gone off on vacation with her sister. Zach has gotten buff. The hair and makeup department have completely given up on the timeline of the show. And we are introduced to our new mermaid, Waylan. I love Waylan, just for the record. She is an Eastern mermaid from Shanghai, played by Vietnamese Australian actress Linda Nyo, who is not only one of the only actors in the show to ever produce like an actual tear, she's the only character who isn't just mean for no reason, which I find hilarious because I think she's supposed to be. I think that's what they were going for with her and with her attitude, because she's like making big messes and she's like sort of abrasive and disrupts the status quo a bunch. And while like she can be frustrating at times because she is a teenager in a children's show, she's got this like dark traumatic backstory, which you know, works for her. It sort of justifies everything. And like, she's just not cruel. You know what I mean? She never goes out of her way to outwardly try and cause anyone harm. What's he doing? So Waylan's pod has been wiped out prior to the show starting, leaving her the sole survivor and her grandmother sends her to come and stay with Rita. And as soon as she appears, so does this. Most of season four does not matter. Like all you really need to know about this season is that Andina spends the first like five or six episodes just attacking Waylan for bringing the dragon to Mako and insinuating that she wiped out her own pod and then gatekeeping the shit out of just mermaidhood itself. A real mermaid would never endanger other mermaids. Meaning? Meaning that I couldn't help but notice that your arrival coincided with the dragons. You think I bought it? Didn't you? But after that, it basically just follows the same pattern as all of the other seasons, which is like a bunch of like body swapping, rapid aging, mermaid hi magic hijinks episodes broken up by the occasional full moon episode in which they try and fail to advance the plot. I mean, to defeat the dragon. And since we're familiar with that already, we're gonna skip ahead a bit because it is time for us to talk about the thing that you think I forgot. The thing that even those of you who haven't seen the show, but find my overwhelming frustration with the meta contextual implications of it, both endearing and concerning, even you know what I'm talking about. And you think I forgot. The thing that half of you have probably already left a comment about me forgetting paragraph after paragraph, tearing my alternate universe theories to shreds. And then the other half of you have already skimmed ahead in the timeline just to see if I really wasn't gonna bring it up. And now you've skipped three vitally important sections of this video, leaving you confused and slightly turned off by my seemingly unjustified rage and passion right now. In which case, your fault, go back, watch them. You don't get to be here if you didn't sit through the ethics conversation. And frankly, I'm offended. I'm offended that any of you thought that I would actually forget this. Ye of little faith, who doubt, wavering, like a wave in the sea. I get it. I empathize. So I encourage you now to make your way down into the comment section and just comment yourself a little, little clown emoji or, or just this timestamp or a bridge, anything you want. Live your life, comment something below, consider your sins forgiven because it is time to talk about this. So, end of season four. They are superbly failing at defeating this dragon, just over and over again, just totally failing. And Mimi and Zach are also having visions of their dead mermom, and the pod is about to get themselves killed, and world famous 
deep sea diver and collector Ricky Chadwick has come to town. Also, pee break. I feel like my bladder has a good sense of dramatic tension. <laughs> I also finished my Slurpee, so. Home stretch, home stretch, home stretch. Where were we? Ricky Chadwick has returned to Mako Island in this dress, no less, in order to promote her new book alongside a series of extremely valuable collectible items that she has retrieved from depths of the ocean that no human could safely withstand. Cast iron statue of an Indian farm worker of 14th century, recovered from the Bay of Bengal at a depth of 2,500 meters. I bet Personally, I don't think that I need to explain to you all why this Ricky Chadwick is so clearly not the Ricky Chadwick that every lower middle class neurodivergent queer idolized in 2008. But just in case you are, for whatever unfathomable reason, still watching this video and haven't seen the show, here's the gist. There is no way that this girl who turned down literally every gift that her stupidly wealthy trust fund boyfriend bought her with daddy's money, right? This girl who fought over and over and over again to keep human beings away from Mako and away from destroying it for their personal gain, who once gave up her powers just to avoid letting people study her lest they find out the secrets of Mako Island. There is, there is no way, there is no way that this girl grows up to be someone who steals ancient relics and valuables from shipwrecks and trenches only to sell them slash put them on loan to museums, write a book about it, and go on to do interviews and press tours like a celebrity. There's no way, there's no way that Ricky Chadwick, who was horrified to find out that she was catching like endangered fish for this man, no way that this woman would start picking up gold jewelry and shit and turning it for a profit. I was a thousand meters down in the dark and the cold. We know what that's like. So maybe you can understand that this is what I do for a living. And I'm not about to give up the bracelet based on some fairy tale. You can save your breath for the police. While you can see some elements of the Ricky that we know in this Ricky, like she's pretty take no shit. And she does mention having had two friends at Mako in the past, but she doesn't mention them by name, so it could have been anybody. And even if it wasn't, they clearly didn't get into enough trouble in their time. <laughs> and Emma and Bella, right? Like, even if Chopin, who regularly guard the moon pool, at least when the asteroid was coming. You know what I mean? Anyway, this Ricky also has powers that our Ricky didn't, which she could have learned like later in life. But either way, the most Ricky thing that she does in this whole season is help the girls steal the bracelet, also known as do the right thing, right? Like that's it. That's the most Ricky thing that she does. Speaking of this bracelet, it's basically just like a magic uh, dragon killing bracelet, which is kind of sick and kind of a duex for media but i'm not really mad about it are you kidding you had me at dragon slayer i think it's cool i think it looks pretty and basically what happens is uh wayland's surrogate uncle uh happens to show her this one mysterious painting this one time and it happens to have this mermaid destroying this dragon with this bracelet on it so they see the bracelet in ricky's exhibit and first they ask her for it, which doesn't work. And then they like low key blackmail her for it, which kind of works. Um, but really what happens is like they have a heart to heart in the moon pool and she decides to help them steal the bracelet so that they can go back to the ocean and do this. The dragon does turn out to be and or have eaten Zack and Mimi's mermaid mom later, but that's like a different, that's a different thing. Uh, right now, what we're gonna focus on is the fact that Ricky just regularly steals artifacts and valuables from the ocean and by extension, other cultures in order to sell them back 
on land and make a killing. So basically this chick cruises the world, goes down in her sub, brings up whatever she likes and gets paid for it. What a lot! Uh, which is not only like culturally insensitive on so many levels, like I don't even think insensitive is the right word, I think it's just like awful, like it's just like bad. You're gonna steal it? It belongs to the Eastern Pod, my people, so technically it's not stealing at all. We know that the Xiaolong bracelet is of Chinese origins and a lot of Ricky's artifacts are from all over the world, which considering that like Nigeria has been trying to get its bronzes back from Britain for like decades and Egypt would very much like their Rosetta Stone back and Greece, Easter Island, you name it, like there are stolen objects in museums that just are not being returned to their countries of origin and ownership, especially in the United States. Indigenous people in the United States have been fighting for their stolen remains and sacred objects for since the country started. It's just not a good look and I don't buy that our Ricky would do that. Maybe you can understand that this is what I do for a living and I'm not about to give up the bracelet based on some fairy tale. You can save your breath for the police. But don't worry, she's not the only one stealing things from other cultures and making a profit off of it. Rita has a literal multi-level grotto built into her lavish beachside mansion just full of treasures and artifacts that she stole from the ocean. There's an entire episode where the plotline is just Mimi and the other mermaids thinking that Eric stole Rita's stolen jewelry in order to sell it to pay for a party that he's throwing for Andina. And it turns out that Eric didn't steal the stolen jewelry because he already has his own stolen jewelry. And that's just like how he survives on land, which is implied how all of mermen survive on land and it's all very sketchy because it's never seen as a bad thing that they do this the point of that episode is not we really shouldn't be stealing things uh from the ocean in order to pay for parties to impress our girlfriends like the message is just like oh we should be stealing things on our own not stealing things other people stole and it's just it's just a weird take it places this like weird focus and emphasis on the accumulation of wealth as like a benefit of being a mer person who lives on land right it's like a bonus perk it's a way to not not just like cheat the system but to beat it to like win at capitalism right and like they don't necessarily have anyone working under them so it's not like they're actively oppressing workers per se uh except for that one guy who works for ricky whose life just seems to be fucking awful but more in the sense that because they have this access to practically endless goods or at least like goods of infinite value that no one else can ever get to except for them they are then able to afford themselves luxuries that the average person cannot it's really just another example of their belief that they are above land people because they're not like using this accumulated wealth to fund schools or build hospitals in countries that need them and like they're not creating scholarships right you know they're not advancing humanity or providing like vital vaccines you know they're they're just building tunnels to the ocean from their house and throwing parties for their girlfriends and speaking of the house, I am American. I don't know how much a house like that costs in Australia. I don't know how much money a principal makes in Australia, but I do know that she hasn't been principal for a decade. She's only been principal for a couple years. And I also know that Zach's dad is a doctor and they live here. So, do with that what you will. There are actually quite like a few good moments in the show that kind of explore the concept of capitalism within the Mako Mermaids universe. There's a scene where the mermaids get in trouble for paying for their clothes with these like weird gold coins that they stole from Rita who stole them from the ocean and then they have to like learn where money comes from and like learn that you can't just steal clothes and you have to buy them and you have to buy them with the appropriate currency. There's also this episode where Serena has been asked to make a bulk order of these handmade bracelets that she makes in order for Evie to sell them and they go like pretty in depth into her process of trying to figure out how many she can make in the shortest amount of time with the amount of seashells that she has stocked up like it's a whole thing even david the only character who matters in any of this show his whole thing 
is that he is nice and he works at this cafe. He later owns the cafe and then he like runs the cafe. He goes to this entrepreneur's leadership seminar thing at one point, which is definitely just like a multi-level marketing, 5 a.m. video, podcast, bro, four hours of sleep, same clothes every day, like bullshit thing. But it's so cute and he's so sweet. Um, and he gets his little suit. It's my favorite, I love it. Uh, but he goes to that and like and cam at one point like buys out half of the cafe shares so that he can keep it alive for david and they like go into business together and it, it's just like a whole thing it's like a, it's a reasonably like important part of the show apparently teenagers owning and running cafes is something that has remained consistent through both of these timelines that and mermaids making the absolutely fucking bonkers decision to work at a marine park I swear to God, I could talk about this marine park in Mako Mermaids for a whole video. I won't. But all I can say is that they do not have a single camera in this marine park. Point is, capitalism has managed to squirm its nasty little hands into even the most pristine of fictional universes. Right? Back to the dragon. So... After girl bossing and gaslighting their way into possession of this bracelet, Zack and Mimi destroy the dragon. They bring back their long lost mother, Nerissa, who has been trapped inside slash was eaten by the dragon by an evil mermaid named Aurora from like 16 years ago. So what happened was Aurora was being like a menace and <laughs> Nerissa had these two kids. I don't know what happened to their father. No one knows. Uh, but she basically was like, I gotta protect my kids. So she dropped Zack on land because mermen are typically brought up on land and she dropped Mimi with the southern pod to keep her away from the northern pod so no one could find her. So that's that explains that. She goes off to the eastern pod, meets Wei Lan, does some magic, impresses everybody, goes off to fight Aurora by herself, at which point she is turned into slash eaten by the water dragon and forced to destroy the eastern pod. Then she uses all of her magic to go dormant and, and to stop destroying people until her two children are old enough to meet and then she will be awakened. Hence the visions, hence the sniffing, that is mystery solved. You know what the really weird thing is? I now have two mothers. And that's that. Everyone's happy. It's all good. No one's upset about anything at all. Except for me, apparently. Because they're hatchlings, right? They say that they're hatchlings, but they also have family relations outside of that. And we also know that mermaids and mermen can reproduce together. And clearly also mermen have been self-reproducing somehow for centuries as well. And there's just, there's just nothing. There's just not an answer. There's no concrete answer. So I'm not gonna sit here and rehash all of the research that I did. I'm not gonna tell you about the Amazon Molly and the way that it uses other similar species to trick its own body into self-reproducing. I'm not gonna talk about the dark and dangerous trails I went down in terms of mermaid theory and fantasy reproduction forums. I'm not even gonna tell you about the email that I sent to Jonathan M. Schiff's production company asking if they had any theories because they never got back to me. And why should they, right? Why are me and Mako Mermaids fan with two ends who posted about this very same thing in September of 2020 on the Mako Mermaids Mermaid's fandom blog. Why are we the only people that care? Right? I don't know. I don't know. And honestly, I don't think that you care. Do you? Right? I don't think that you give a shit. I don't think that anybody else gives a shit. And I think, like, I think that maybe that's the point. I don't know. Oh, for all of this talk about ecofeminism and utopian societies, right? For all of this, like, deep diving into ethics and consumerism and the dangers of gender binaries and essentialist thinking. There are just parts of societies that we don't understand. We can analyze a group of people's lifestyle to the bitter end. You know, we can study and document everything they do, both historically and concurrently, and like always be missing something. <laughs> No matter how far we go, no matter how deeply we like immerse ourselves into something or how obsessively we research it, we as outsiders 
may never be able to wrap our heads around their magic. How many cultures have we, you know, particularly white people, particularly colonizers, like how many cultures have we decided that we know based on stolen artifacts and stories told by the winners? How many times have we decided that ancient peoples were or were not capable of a certain thing based on our own theories and, and things that we find buried beneath the surface, both literally and figuratively, like even on a personal level, like I know I am not the only person of privilege, particularly white privilege, but you know, all forms of privilege. I'm not the only person like actively trying to combat their privilege by educating themselves on other cultures and like listening to oppressed voices and trying to do my best to understand perspectives that I, I don't have. But as much as like, you know, I like to think of myself as, as an ally doing the best I can, I, I think that I need to remember that, that it's not always enough. I need to remember that no matter how much I learn, it'll never be enough. And that's not okay, but it is true. You know, I, I, I don't, I can't, I don't want to get ahead of myself in thinking that I know everything there is to know and that I have like checked the ally box ever. Learning as much as you can is not the end, right? And I didn't have like a meaning of life thesis planned when I started this video, so you can take from it what you want. But I think that what I'm gonna be taking from this is that I need to get comfortable with the fact that I live in a world where I will never be able to understand everything about the people that I share this planet with, but I still need to try and understand everything. You may never know where babies come from, but you still need to email the showrunner. Whew, switching to water. That was a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Thank you for watching that, if you watched all of that. That is insane. I wish I could give you a prize. Um, I can only really give you the number of a good therapist. <laughs> um, but in any case, all of the resources that I used for everything that I said will be in the description. And no, it will not be in MLA format because I did not graduate for nothing, okay? Uh, feel free to kindly correct me on anything that I may have misspoken on or, you know, cited incorrectly. I'm very open to corrections. However, I have such a fragile sense of self. Please be kind about it. And yeah, like I would say subscribe but I don't know if I'll ever do another one of these. This is not really my thing. It kind of felt like a one-off, but I did have a really good time. I did really enjoy this. I love a good hyper-focus. So like, I'll think about it. it. Give me ideas, I guess. Leave your comment. Oh, I hate this. Ugh. I feel just like, leave your comments. Like leave a comment with an idea. Like if you have an idea or if you like kind of see a a threadbare connection between like a piece of media and a critical lens and it's something that I happen to have seen uh, leave it and maybe I'll look at it and think about possibly maybe doing this again maybe but probably not this was so much I don't know anyway um, <laughs> thank you for watching my apologies go out to the cast and crew of Mako Mermaids for all of this I'm so sorry because this was, this was too much. You know, I know that, you know that. I did it anyway. I'm sorry. Please don't copyright claim this. Thank you as well to the video essayists that I watch, because this is all that I watch on YouTube. So I'll like put some names of the people that inspired me, um, either deliberately or just through my constant consumption of their content on repeat. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. And to the rest of you, like, Live your life, enjoy yourselves, have a good time, drink some fucking water. Right. Bye. And all your exes think you're crazy and all of 